So um, last week we uh, discussed, uh, so we were discussing Chen Simon's theory, pure Chen Simon's theory, and we um, discussed a very useful correspondence between uh, 3D uh, Chen Simon's theory and uh, um, two dimensional chiral algebras. And, uh, um, and essentially the point was that uh, once we have this tool, essentially this tool with some more technology that we have not uh, uh, explained allows us to understand all properties of the Chen-Simons theory that we are interested in and to perform um, computations in this theory, in particular to compute all, all correlators that we might be interested in. Now we mentioned a small piece of this, of this correspondence. In particular, we say that if we are interested in what is the spectrum of lines uh, and their spin uh, h, uh, we can read it off uh, the chiral algebra because this corresponds to the uh, irreducible uh, representations or integral representations of this, of this algebra. And uh, the dimension, uh, the conformal dimension of the primary, this were h lambda, and h as the dimension of h lambda, uh, mod 1, uh, because the spin is defined mod 1. Um, so, um, um, and then this correspondence go on, and, and, and there is more structure here, and one can use to compute uh, everything we want in the, in the Chen Simons theory. In particular, the Chen Simons theory is a, is a solvable theory. One can use this to compute everything we want. And so this allows us to uh, show and, and prove, we will not prove it, but it can be proven, uh, the first duality that I want to present, which is uh, eleven rank duality. And so, uh, in our definition of, of Chen Simon's theory, we start, so we have a Lagrangian definition. So we start with some gauge group G and some level K. Uh, but what it might happen is that, uh, it, so we start with two descriptions that look different, so different gauge group, a different level, but nevertheless, the quantum theory is the same. Okay, and level angular duality is, is one example of this, of this phenomenon. In particular, um, it turns out that SUN at level K, uh, and let me use this symbol now for, uh, for a duality, uh, is the same theory, the same quantum theory as UK level minus N. Okay? So this, of course, look different, the group is different, the level is different, but the quantum theory is the same. In particular, the spectrum of lines is the same, and all the correlators between the lines, if you use the dictionary, is the same. And uh, uh, this duality, as I said, this can be proven because both sides are, are solvable, and you can solve them, and you can see they are the same. In particular, what you can do is to see that both uh, descriptions lead to exactly the same chiral algebra. And so if the chiral algebra is the same, everything that you compute with it is going to be the same. Okay, we will not go, to the uh, go through the derivation of this. The derivation is essentially starts with the two-dimensional bosonization. So the fact that uh, free fermions can be described uh, with a WZW model, and then one has to do some manipulation, and one can prove this. Uh, now, just to give you some flavor of this, of this duality, um, we can have a look at what, what is the spectrum of lines. So, we analyze this case because uh, one, one example that we gave of this was the, the example in which the group G was simple, compact, connected, and simply connected. So, SUN is in that class, and we said in that case, the two-dimensional chiral algebra is a fine Lie algebra at level k. And uh, we said what are the integrable representations of this. 
in particular where representations where uh, if you take the weight, the highest weight of the representation, and you take the product with the highest, uh, the highest root, uh, this has to be uh, smaller or equal to k. Now, if we translate this in the case of SUN, what we find is the following. So remember, for SUN, we can represent uh, the representations, or if you want, these sets of linking labels, in terms of Young diagrams. Okay, in particular for SUN, the Young diagrams will have to, uh, if I have some Young diagram here, so the Young diagram should have at most um, at most um, n minus one uh, box, so the, 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 the height of these columns should be at most n minus one, yes. I'm trying, but <laughs> uh, yeah. The blue one. The blue is better. Ah. Okay. It looks the same, but okay. Let's see. So uh, the Young diagrams, uh, so first of all, Young diagrams that uh, um, represent representations of a SUN should have at most n minus um, one boxes uh, in the columns. And then this condition means that uh, the number of columns should be at most k. And so essentially the lines in SUN level k are all the Young diagrams that you can draw inside a rectangle uh, with size a minus one and k, okay? Now we have not discussed this case here, but one can, because this, is, this group is not, um, for instance, simply connected. Um, but one can do um, a, 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 um, a similar thing here, and it turns out that the lines here up to a small subtlety that I will mention in a, in a second uh, can also be classified integral representations by uh, Young diagrams, uh, but this time the, the, the number of boxes in the columns should be at most k, and the number of boxes, the, the maximum length of these, uh, of these rows should be at most n minus one. And so uh, the map of the lines is that you have to take this Young diagram and flip it along the diagonal, and then it will fit in here. Okay, so it's the same rectangle, but it is flipped along the diagonal. Is this clear? Okay. So I would like to make two comments about this, this duality. The first comment is a technical uh, remark. And it is the fact that really this duality is not a duality of standard Chen Simons theories, but it's a duality of uh, spin theories or spin Chen Simons theories. Um, and uh, so I do not have time to explain, to explain this point. I can give you some more details if you ask in the uh, discussion session. Uh, but, okay, ju ju just to mention that one has to do a small operation on this theory if we really want to be precise and really have two theories which are um, uh, really dual. Okay, but this is a small, a small remark. Um, and then uh, a comment. Is that um, there is a special case here you see, if you take n equal to one, okay? Because if you take n equal to one here, uh, well, SU1 is, uh, is the trivial group with just the identity. So this theory becomes trivial. And so what this duality tells us is that the theories, uh, let me write them as UN level one, are a bit special. In fact, these are examples of what we can call trivial topological field theories. So, uh, 
Um, so these are theories for which uh, there is a single gap vacuum on any spatial manifold. Now remember one of the so topological theories in general describe gapped systems. Okay. Yeah, it's not really important because, okay, I wrote this, so, well, thank you for the question. Uh, I wrote this duality, but you can take uh, a parity transformation. So what parity does is to invert the sign of the Chen-Simons level because uh, the Chen-Simons action, if I'm writing components, the, 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 the Lagrangian is um, a new, uh, the new a row, uh, plus two thirds a mu a nu a rho, and then there is uh, epsilon mu nu rho. And so if you change, uh, if you do a parity transformation, this changes sign. And the Chen-Simons level gets a, a minus. So you can perform a So first of all, this theory is, Chen-Simons theory is not parity invariant. Okay, if you apply a parity transformation, it changes, the level goes into minus itself. And uh, what well, is a duality? You can apply parity on both sides, and then you have another duality in which you have SUN level minus K, which is equal to UK level N. Okay? So I will not write the dualities twice. It's always meant that we take positive numbers for N and K, and then there are the corresponding ones. And so in particular, these, these also are, are, are trivial. But thank you. So, um, so uh, topological theories, and some theories in particular, um, they describe gapped systems where there are no dynamical degrees of freedom, but still, as we say, they are not just trivially gap vacua because depending on the topology of space, uh, we can have a degeneracy in the Hilbert space, so multiple degenerate states at zero energy, now, if you, watch in a, in, if you wish, in a trivial topological field theory, there is one single gapped state for any topology, and so uh, really there is, no, there, there is nothing non-trivial going on here. Uh, up to the fact that um, um, still there is a framing anomaly, uh, and in fact, uh, the fact that the Hilbert space contains a single state on any spatial topology means that the partition function should be just a phase. Uh, however, this phase should capture the, 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 the framing anomaly. And so all the content, if you wish, in these theories is the framing anomaly. Uh, and since there is no dynamical content, uh, it turns out that the partition function is fixed classically, okay, there's no dynamics. And in fact, this partition function is just a local integral of, of the background fields. So in particular, just to be concrete, uh, in, these, in these theories, uh, the partition function um, turns out to be equal to, uh, so it's a phase, and now it's a local integral of something that, uh, uh, so let me write in this way, minus two n uh, gravitational Chen Simons term. Okay, so this is a classical integral. This is a classical functional uh, of the metric. And uh, um, well, let me write it here. So we can write it, uh, so we could write in, th in three dimensional terms. Let, write, uh, let, let me write it in four dimensional terms. So taking some four manifold whose, whose boundary is the three manifold we are interested in, um, this is the Chen Simons term constructed with the, with the spin connection. Okay. So, so this object is purely classical. Okay. This is just a background field. We are not doing gravity. So G is not a dynamical field that we are integrating over in the path integral. It's just classical. Uh, but this captures precisely the the um, framing anomaly of the theory. In particular, this two Chen Simons graph is, uh, corresponds to C equal to one. If you uh, work out all the numbers, D corresponds to C equal to one, which is uh, essentially the framing anomaly of a system whose boundary is, uh, 
is a, is a real scalar or, or a complex fermion, okay? Okay, are there questions? Okay, so now I would like to leave the topological world and start talking about um, theories with uh, dynamical gapless degrees of freedom. And so the first example that I would like to discuss is particle vortex duality. Is not. Uh, as I said, so we are discussing just field theory. And so, uh, so this term, this is a function, I don't know if you, you can see it, it's a function of the metric. It's a purely classical object because for us the metric is just a background field, it's not in path integrated over. Uh, and it's consistent with the fact that this theory has no dynamics. If you wish, is, is there, there is a phase which caps the, 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 captures the, the framing anomaly, but it's completely classical. So the full partition function is a classical integral or local function, function of the background fields. Yes, it's constructed with the spin connection, yes. Sure, in fact, I mean, we know that this, uh, um, this is a topological invariant up to the framing anomaly. Um, because, um, so we say that if you change this, uh, this framing, so if you change the way in which, so if you want, the reason is that there is this huge denominator here so this one is not properly normalized to be uh, well-defined in three dimensions. You remember we have this discussion that we complete with a four-manifold, and the result is unambiguous, completely unambiguous, if when you evaluate this object on a closed four-manifold, you get a multiple of two pi. And from this one, we, you, you, you don't, because this corresponds to C equal to one. In our convention, C equal 24 is, is an object with, uh, which uh, is, is uh, I mean, give you phase one, so it, gave you, it doesn't give you anything in, in three dimensions. But this is uh, 1 24th of, of that. Yes, if you take uh, uh, U24, then you, get, you, you don't get any phase at all. Other questions? Okay. Um, okay, so I want to discuss particle vortex duality. This was proposed by Peskin, Dasgupta, and Halperin. And... Uh, So, um, so in order to understand this duality, so let's start discussing the abelian X model. Okay, in, in two plus one dimensions, of course. Uh, so what is this? Uh, so we have uh, abelian gauge field, so U1, zero. There is no chain simons interaction, it's just Ian Mills. And then we have a complex complex scalar, okay, with charge one under this U1, and, uh, uh, and then we take a potential, which is uh, a mass term, and uh, a quartic interaction, which is, uh, well, it's, it's relevant in, in, in three dimensions, uh, but we take M squared negative, 
okay? So, so this potential is the Mexican hot potential, okay? We take this mass uh, large, so we can do a classical analysis. And uh, uh, so since this is the maximum hot potential, uh, there is uh, uh, symmetry breaking because phi condenses. Uh, but since this symmetry is, is caged, this is the X mechanism. And so uh, the system is gapped. Now, it turns out that this in, in this theory, uh, there are vortices. These are some, uh, solito some solitons, some solitonic configurations, uh, such that, so if we take, so this is our space, is R2, and uh, the space of vacua is a, is a circle, okay? So you can construct, you can try to construct uh, uh, solutions of the uh, equations of motion which are time independent and such that as you go uh, around uh, uh, I mean a circle uh, very far from the origin, you also wind once in the space of vacuum in field space, okay? So you construct a solution where phi and radial coordinates of R and theta is some radial profile uh, e to the i theta. So when, when, you once, uh, when you wind once in space, you also wind once in, uh, in, in field space. And uh, so you construct a radial uh, um, rotationally symmetric configuration. And in general, you also turn on, you also have to turn on uh, some field strength. And uh, in particular, since there will be some field strength, it turns out that these solutions, the ones that, the, 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 the ones that wind once in, uh, in field space, they have one unit of uh, magnetic flux. Okay? So essentially, these solutions uh, have some bump of, uh, of, uh, of flux around the origin and uh, they differ from, from the vacuum uh, around the origin. Well, if you go far away, they essentially go to the, to the vacuum. Okay. Now, you can write down, so this is a very simple theory, you can write down the equations of motion, you can try to solve these equations. They cannot be solved analytically, but you can easily solve them numerically. And uh, um, so you can construct, basically construct the solutions. Uh, and then you can ask, okay, what is the mass of these solutions? You compute the energy of these solutions. And what you find is the following. So if you, if you are just considering the theory with the scalar, without the gauge field, you would find that, in fact, these solitons do not have finite mass or finite energy. Because you would find that the energy is logarithmically divergent with the size of your, uh, of your um, you construct your solution. And you see that the, the solution here, for instance, for phi, um, well, just for phi, because we are considering a case in which there is no gauge field now, uh, approaches the vacuum with a power law, okay? And then you plug into the energy, and you find that this energy is, um, is logarithmically divergent. With some infrared cutoff. However, if you consider now the theory with the gauge, and so now you have also to, to do this, and you once again study your, your solutions, you find that now the vacuum is approached exponentially, and so now the energy is finite. For the uh, abelian X model. So very different behavior. And so, um, so this theory has finite mass solitons. And so the idea is that if we go at very low energies, um, 
and uh, um, we turn on a mass which is, which is small compared to the scale set by, by, the, by the gauge coupling, uh, we can describe the theory as uh, a weakly interacting model of, uh, of, of these solitons. Um, and in particular, we can write down a theory in which uh, the solitons are described by a fundamental field. And so we describe essentially these, these solitons as weakly interacting particles, and we introduce some scalar field phi tilde, and we write a weakly interacting theory for some massive uh, scalar field, because these, these, these solitons are, are massive. And so the theory that we will write is just a theory of a scalar field with some potential, uh, with a certain mass, and then we can include the first interaction which is a quartic interaction, okay? So this phi tilde, this, this field phi tilde uh, represents uh, the vortices. If you want, it's the creation operator for, uh, for vortices, for these solitons. Um, and uh, um, now notice, so here m tilde squared is positive, and notice that here, up to the fact that we have this positive mass, this is precisely the O2 vector model uh, that Igor was talking about uh, yesterday, okay? This is a complex scalar. You can write it in terms of two real fields. And there is O2 symmetry uh, that corresponds to rotating this field and taking the charge conjugate. So this is precisely the O2 vector model. Now, um, what happens if we try to invert? Uh, are, are there questions so far? So what happens if we try to invert the sign of this mass? Okay, so let's see what happens if we take now positive mass here and, uh, uh, and then negative mass here. Now, if we take positive mass here, now this field phi is massive. So, okay, if the mass is large, we integrate it out, and we are left with U1 level zero, Young-Mills theory. But in fact, this is a free theory, okay? This is a free photon. And a free photon in two plus one dimensions can be dualized into a free scalar. Uh, but importantly, a free compact scalar. Okay, we can call sigma. And this dualization is the standard dualization that, for instance, you do in four dimensions when you want to do electric ma magnetic duality of an abelian, uh, free abelian gauge field. So essentially, you are right, uh, well, you, here you have your Young-Mills action written in terms of F. So F wedge star F. Uh, you are write it, writing uh, star F as uh, some D sigma. Okay, um, and that is because, if you wish, the, the, the Maxwell equation of motion say that this is closed, and so you write it as the differential of something, okay? Now, it is important that this sigma is, is compact, and one way, one simple way to see that this sigma should be compact, by the way, compact, I mean that sigma should be identified with sigma plus two pi, Um, or if I want it properly normalized, here I should put the correct mass scale, which is uh, probably G. And one way to see that this should be the case is because, uh, for instance, so suppose that we are looking at some field configuration on S2 times S1, and then in the path integral we would be summing over fluxes on this, on this S2, 
right? because one of the two pi integral of f should be quantized. And in the path integral, we should sum over all these quantized fluxes. But now if you use this map, you see that in this configuration, the sigma is constant. And so if you want to reproduce these this field configurations, you need configurations where this sigma is constant on the S1. And so if you integrate it, sigma cannot go back to itself since the derivative is constant. It has to shift by 2 pi. And OK, here I'm not careful with all the coefficients. OK? So this sigma lives in S1. Yes? So here I'm doing purely a classical analysis. I'm taking the mass large, okay? And the mass is very large. And I do a semi-classical analysis. When the mass is large, phi is massive, I can integrate it out. Yes, again, I take large negative mass, and, and this is the, there is condensation. I'm not trying to understand here what I'm for small mass, which is hard. Uh, I'm just doing very large mass compared to the gauge, uh, to the mass set by the gauge coupling. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I'm sad in that case. I'm saying what happens in that case? Here? Yes. Yes, I'm saying I'm taking some particles with the, say, large mass. Yeah, this is purely classical analysis. This one here? Yes, we will come to this in a second, but Yes. Um, so in this theory, as we say, when the mass is positive, now we integrate out the scalar field, and we are left with this free photon, which is a free compact scalar, S1. So now what happens in this theory? So now in this theory, we take, um, if you wish, a large negative mass squared. And uh, uh, well, uh, also here, there are no mysteries. Because if the mass is large, now again, we have the same phenomenon. We break the symmetry, but this time we break a global symmetry. And so we have the Goldstone mechanism, not the Higgs. And so we have a Goldstone boson, uh, which is S1. Because the, the symmetry that we break is a U1 that rotates this phi tilde. And so from here, we also get some S1 uh, free, free scalar. Okay? And so, uh, surprisingly, uh, we started with uh, an attempt to describe these, uh, these, these, these vortices with some dual theory that was working for some value of the mass, but in fact, the, this duality works also for the other value of the mass. Okay? We have a match. Now, in this theory, which is the O2 vector model, so in, in both theories, we find for large values of the mass, we find two phases. Oh, yeah, so, I mean, of course, when you do this, if I take sigma to be canonically uh, normalized, now sigma is dimension one half, so I want to put here something which is the, uh, dimension one half, uh, which is g, because g squared is dimension of mass, so g is dimension of uh, mass, uh, square root of mass. So if you wish, it is true that this theory is free, and you might ask, uh, okay, so what about the gauge coupling? Uh, if it is free, there is no, I mean, this doesn't appear anywhere, but still it looks like it's setting a scale for us. And in fact, this scale also appears here because this is a free scalar, but the radius of the, of the, of the manifold, um, of the target manifold uh, needs a scale, uh, which, which is this very same scale.
okay. Um, so we found these this phases. Uh, so let me plot uh, m, m squared. And so what did we say? So for positive m squared, here there was an S1, uh, it's a linear sigma model. Okay, this would, would like to be a non-linear sigma model, but in this case, just one free scalar, so it's actually linear. And here the system is gapped. Now, in the case of the O2 uh, vector model, we know that in fact, so well, first of all, we know that there must be at least one phase transition in the middle because these two phases are different. But now we know that in the O2 vector model, there is in fact just one phase transition, and this is a second order phase transition. It's a CFT. Okay? And so the claim of the particle vortex duality is that in fact, also the gauge theory, uh, it is dual to that, and so it has precisely one phase transition, and this, uh, this phase transition is uh, second order, okay? This is not obvious, uh, but this is the claim of the duality. Now, as I said, this is not obvious, but this has been uh, extensively checked, uh, in particular with the uh, lattice Monte Carlo simulation, and uh, um, well, as far as we know, I mean, everything's consistent, so we, we do believe that this duality is correct. Yes? Um, I think that for a... Yeah, I think that there are, uh, there are no... I mean, there are um, clashing claims. For instance, this, this is the very case that some people would like to say that there is SO5 and unsymmetry, but it's not clear if this is true. I mean, there are no definite uh, results, right, uh, from, from the numerics. Yes, uh, I mean, I don't have much to say on the case U1 with two scalars. That will be somehow outside of the domain of, of the claims of these dualities. But when you say there is extensive... For, for, for one scalar, for one scalar. Uh, as far as I can, uh, can see, yes. I mean, the, okay, I don't know how, how, what you mean by a, a lot, but uh, I think there is a consensus with, with one complex scalar, the lattice Monte Carlo but simulation. That is also some theoretical work that has been done. So one can write an explicit uh, nonlinear map on the, on the lattice fields, but there's also numerical uh, lattice Monte Carlo simulation. Okay, if you have a reference for that, that would be Yeah, yeah, but I, I mean, I, I can give. Okay. Um, so, um, in any case, I mean, in this, in this, for, uh, for, for these are the following dualities, as I said, we cannot prove them, and so I will state what the conjectures are. We can make checks, various type of checks, but uh, we, I will never make a claim that some duality I, I, is correct. So eventually we will have to do uh, numerical simulations and, and see whether these proposals are correct. Uh, but the proposals are, are, are sharp, so either they are correct or wrong. So in this case, for this duality, I will use the following notation. So uh, u1 level zero uh, with phi uh, dual to uh, just phi tilde, which is the O2 vector model. Okay, so in particular, in this notation, uh, I will just write the fields that we have every time there is a complex, um, sorry, every time there is a scalar, I will implicitly 
uh, assume that there are uh, quartic interactions for this guy. We'll not write them, but they're always implicitly there. Okay? Um, so, um, so what checks can we do of this, of this duality? Um, so, okay, we already checked that the phases match, at least when the mass is large and one can do a semi-classical analysis. Uh, we can try to compare the symmetries. So in this, sim in this, for this theory, the global symmetry uh, is O2, which is uh, a U1 that rotates uh, the field phi tilde, uh, times a uh, charge conjugation, which is a Z2, um, there is also parity and time reversal. Now what about this theory? So clearly here the symmetry that rotates phi is not there because it's gauge, it's not a global symmetry. However, there is another global symmetry, which is called the, the magnetic or topological, And uh, uh, this is a symmetry whose current is constructed out of the field strength. So this is epsilon mu nu rho f nu rho. And uh, uh, this is conserved uh, just because of the Bianchi identity, okay? In terms of form, we will write this in the following way. And uh, um, in fact, what uh, this does, well, if you go in the, in the case, so if we consider the case in which this was massive and we're left with a free photon, this, uh, this current, uh, which is precisely equal to d sigma, uh, what it does is to shift sigma. So if you go in this phase, what this current, what this symmetry does is to shift that free scalar. And so, in fact, this free scalar is itself a Goldstone boson. And so for this reason, we are sure that uh, it cannot receive, uh, uh, I mean, c there cannot be any potential from some additive corrections because this is actually a Goldstone boson for the broken magnetic symmetry. Um, so there is this minus U1, which is mapped to, to this U1, and then uh, there is also charge conjugation uh, as well as parity and uh, entire uh, reversal. So the, the symmetries match. Uh, any question? So what about operators? So in general, it's very hard if we have a duality to draw a complete uh, dictionary between the operators. In principle, there should be one. Uh, but in general, it's very hard to write it. However, we can map certain simple operators, especially if we consider the simplest operators with a certain charge. Now here, there is an operator which is charged under this U1, it's just the complex scalar phi. So what is the operator here, the corresponding operator which is charged under this magnetic symmetry? Oh, yes. Just one. This charge conjugation. Yes. How does it act on the... It's on the... Charge. So, yeah, so, uh, so first of all, you, you take the, the complex uh, conjugate of the scalar field, and then it maps the gauge field to minus itself. This is the general action of, uh, of uh, charge conjugation. And it turns out that, uh, well, you see it from here. Since charge conjugation maps A mu to minus A mu, it also changes the charge. Uh, so it acts on this, on this uh, current. And that is the reason why I'm using this strange symbol, which is not just a product, the semi-direct product, because charge conjugation really acts on this symmetry. So everything matches nicely. Um, yes, so the operator in this theory that is mapped to the complex scalar is uh, the monopole operator. So let me explain what, uh, what does this mean. The monopole operator So monopole operators are uh, local operators. 
However, they are called sometimes disorder operators. or defect operators because uh, they are not defined as uh, the most standard local operators we are used to as some polynomial function of the fundamental fields in the Lagrangian, but rather they are defined as some uh, singular boundary conditions at some location in space. So what does it mean? So suppose that I want to compute uh, a correlation function of these operators. So if I want to define this operator, essentially I have to tell you how to compute correlation functions, okay? So suppose that I want to compute a correlation function of some monopole operators at x times something else. And now the way to do that is um, to set up a path integral. Uh, so let, let, let me call phi all the, all the fields in the theory. Um, so in general, here we insert uh, uh, whatever standard operator we have. However, we specify that when we have point x, we cut a small ball around x, and then we impose a boundary condition, uh, some non-trivial boundary condition at x. And uh, uh, this condition, uh, for instance, in the abelian case, so for an abelian gauge theory, is that uh, there is some non-trivial flux on these on this two sphere. Let's say that I want to, construct, to consider the basic monopole operator. So there is one unit of flux on this, on this sphere. And this is some singular boundary condition, because since the flux is constant, if I shrink this sphere, it means that the connection is, or if you want, the field strength is becoming very large, is, is, is diverging. And so the prescription is that correlation function monopole operators are computed in the standard way. Uh, however, I have to integrate over field configurations which are not smooth at x, but they have some uh, prescribed singularity at x. Okay? So this is what monopole operators are. Um, more generally, uh, if we have some non-trivial so if you have some non-abelian theory, we should specify that on this S2, there is some non-trivial gauge bundle. And since these gauge bundles are parameterized by pi 1 of G, where G is the gauge group, in fact, this is the group of magnetic charges. that monopole operators can, can have. These are conserved charges, okay? And in this case here, it's in fact, uh, uh, it's in fact a U1, because the magnetic charges are, are all the integers, um, and so the corresponding group is, is U1. Now, um, in the presence of, of Chen Simon's interaction, uh, Chen Simon's interaction, what uh, happens is that these, let me call them bare monopole operators, uh, are, not, are not gauge invariant. They have some, well, maybe save this. Um, so if we have Chen Simon's interaction, it means that the bare monopole has gauge charge. One way to see that is that if we are on a, on a manifold, on a three manifold with a boundary, and you do a gauge transformation of the Chen Simons action, you, you get a boundary term. And so in particular, if you try, I'm not doing this computation because I don't have much time, you can, you can try to do it. You, if you do a gauge transformation, you will get a boundary term on this sphere. When this sphere is very small, essentially you pick up a, a phase that depends on the gauge transformation and x, and we interpret this as the fact that the operator is not gauge invariant, transform under gauge transformations. And so in order to construct gauge invariant operators, we have to dress this bare monopole with some of the fundamental fields in the theory. Okay? So we have to construct some composite object. Um, and because of this fact, monopole operators in Chen Simon's theories can also get uh, uh, flavor charges or spin, essentially because you dress them with the fundamental fields, which can be charged under some other global symmetry. Well, 
Well, I'm jumping between Lorenzin and Euclidean. Uh, but uh, no, I mean, this, uh, so this definition is, is both, lo I mean, you can do it in Lorentzian. This is also Lorentzian signature. I mean, it's a, it's a local operator, so you can do it in Lorentzian. You still cut a ball around the point, and you impose non trivial boundary conditions around that point. You can do it directly in Lorentzian. Yes. Okay, uh, however, okay, for the particular case that we are looking at, this is not an issue yet because the level is zero. So in fact, the bare monopole operator is gauge invariant. And uh, this bare monopole operator, in fact, is, uh, as we said, is precisely the operator which is charged under this uh, magnetic current. Um, and so it's precisely the operator which is dual to these uh, fields phi tilde. Uh, the other piece of the operator map is that if we take phi squared, should be mapped to minus phi tilde squared, because this was precisely the operator that we were using to do the relevant deformation to move into the two phases, okay, uh, with a minus sign. Okay. Um, now, um, We can write the duality in a slightly more precise way, in the sense that we can include a little bit more data. And this will be useful uh, later or, or tomorrow. Uh, so in particular, since we have global symmetries, we can couple this global symmetry to background fields. This is extremely useful in general in quantum field theory. And tomorrow, we'll spend a lot of time talking about this, this procedure. Um, this is useful because essentially, once we couple to background phase, we can construct observables, which are essentially the partitions function of the theory uh, on, on various backgrounds. And of course, I mean, it's also useful because if you compute functional derivatives, you compute all the correlators. And so in particular, we can rewrite this, this duality coupling to the background fields. Uh, okay, let me just introduce a background field for this U1. Okay, in principle, we could do better, but this would be complicated. So we introduce some BMO, and let me just as a notation use capital letters for background fields and uh, small letters for uh, dynamical fields, which are path integrated. Uh, so I can write the duality in the following way. And, and this is very schematic, so I'm not careful about coefficients here. The only thing I'm careful about are the coefficients of St. Simon's terms, uh, because they should be quantized, okay? Just a second. Yes? Is this duality between the two particles? For what? Is this no, so, so, so the claim is that this is a duality of, uh, uh, so this is an infrared duality of uh, around the second order phase transition. So if you want, they flow. So the second order of transition is the same CFT. The claim is that if you do small deformations, uh, you get the same. And now if you take larger, uh, larger uh, deformations, I mean, the, the duality is still correct if you are at small enough energies. In particular, when we said, OK, let's take some, uh, some mass, for instance, in the abelian X model, uh, there are these vortices. Uh, of course, if you, if you go at energies which are larger than the mass of the vortices, and then you reach the, 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 the scale, the mass scale set by the photon. Of course, you see that the theory, I mean, contains, uh, contains a photon and so on. Uh, but if you remain at small enough energies, you just keep. Uh, so when you compare them. So this is the CFT. Yes, so that is a claim about the CFT. OK, so here I'm, write, I'm writing the duality. So what I've introduced is the field B, the background field. So here it's obvious, okay, because uh, how I couple this theory to a background field, it goes in the covariant derivative. Here maybe it's a little bit less obvious. Let me also say that I'm not writing the Yamil's term, it's implicit, but it's, it's there. 
uh, so the coupling is, is through this term here, and what this term here is nothing else than the uh, minimal coupling between the magnetic current and B, and if you, okay, this J is star F, if you write in terms of forms, and you do some uh, par partial integration, it becomes this mixed Chen Simons term, okay? So this mixed Chen Simons term is just the standard coupling, linear coupling of B to the, to the, to the, to the current. Okay. Um, then I would like to discuss another example. Which is the example of, uh, uh, of uh, flux attachment, how it's called in the, in the uh, condensed matter literature, or, or uh, bosonization. So flux attachment uh, is um, some simple idea, some smart, simple idea that I think it goes back to wheel check. Uh, and the idea is the following. So if we have some particle, um, so for instance, suppose we have some bosonic particle, and we manage to attach to this particle one quantized unit of magnetic flux, then this particle becomes a, a, a fermion. And one way to understand then is that, so suppose they have two of these objects, which is a particle attached to a one unit of magnetic flux. Now we like to exchange these two particles. So I can do that by taking one and moving it around the other one by half rotation. Now when I do that, I pick up uh, Aronov uh, bomb uh, phase. Uh, but since this is just half of the rotation, this phase is minus one, okay? So when I rotate this, I get a minus one. And so this is telling me that these are uh, fermions, okay? So this is the basic idea. Uh, we can realize this idea in, uh, in the relativistic context of quantum field theory, again, with Chen Simon's theory. And so in particular, we can consider the following theory, uh, which is U1 level one with uh, uh, phi. So very similar to the theory that we had before, but now I have a Chen Simon's theory at level one, okay? So why this model realizes this flux attachment? Well, because, so a unit of flux is a particle with a unit of flux is essentially some, something which is created by the monopole operator. So we look at the monopole operator here. However, for what we said, uh, there is a one unit of Chen Simon's uh, level, and so because of that, their monopole has gauge charge one. It's not gauge invariant. How do we make it gauge invariant? Well, we have to dress it with one mode from phi star, uh, if you want the, the, the complex conjugate, uh, which has a charge, a gauge charge minus one, okay? So we have to dress it. Now, what does it mean that we dress it? So, for instance, we can define this operator in radial quantization. Uh, and if we do that, we would go to S2 uh, times R. We would put one unit of magnetic flux because this is the basic monopole operator. And then we would uh, put one zero mode of this uh, scalar field phi star. But now, if we look at this Landau problem, so we ask, okay, what, are the, what is the spectrum of a scalar uh, in, this, uh, in this magnetic flux? If one of these problems is solved, uh, so that the spectrum of the Laplacian uh, for, this, uh, for this field here, and this problem is solved by the magnetic uh, spherical harmonics, uh, and the result is that, in fact, there are two zero modes, and two zero mode, these two zero modes form a doublet under a rotation. So this is a spin one half doublet. And so when you dress, uh, when you dress uh, this monopole with one of these zero modes, 
the gauge invariant operator becomes a spin one half operator, so it becomes a fermionic operator. So if you want, this was the bare one, and the gauge invariant one uh, has a spin one half. And now um, the claim, which again we cannot prove, of uh, uh, bosonization is that in fact at low energy, if we, uh, maybe this is a point that I've not emphasized before, so if we tune uh, the value of the mass, so in, even, even in the previous case, so the particle was divided, there was a mass term, and if we want to hit the CFT, we have to do a tuning of it, so here as well. So if you tune um, the mass um, appropriately, the low energy theory, in fact, is, is, is a free fermion. So this, this spin one half operator, in fact, describes a, a free fermion. So U1, 1, I, comes just a free fermion. And so in particular, as you said, the monopole operator, the gauge invariant monopole operator, is mapped to the fermionic operator psi here. And uh, uh, for instance, the mass term, and this we are going to check in a second, is mapped to uh, a mass term here. OK? So, um, so in fact, uh, I mean, if we propose this duality, we should, we should check if this makes sense. And so, um, OK, first of all, we should check the symmetries. That is, works exactly in the same way as before, because this psi is a, yes? You mean the monopole? Yes, so I will. I only want to discuss gauge invariant operators. Yes. Otherwise, I will write bare if, if it's not. Yes. I'm almost done. <laughs> um, yeah, so the analysis of the symmetries is the same as before. It doesn't change. So there is U1 times charge conjugation here. There is magnetic symmetry and charge conjugation here. Uh, what about the phases? So what if we deform? Clearly, the phases of this theory is quite different than before because this is a free fermion. If we give a mass to the fermion, we, we have a gapped system on both sides. We don't have a, 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 Goldstone, a Goldstone boson. Um, if you do the analysis here, well, when the mass is negative, it's the same as before because this field condenses and there is X mechanism, and this is gapped, which is the same as before. The difference is when the mass is positive, because now we are left with U1 level 1. It's not U1 level 0. And this is one of the theories that we discussed before. This is a trivial uh, quantum, uh, topological quantum field theory. So uh, it has a single gap vacuum on any uh, spatial uh, topology. Uh, and so perfectly matches with, uh, with a fermion, okay? Okay, we'll stop here.